Wilford's chambers. Oh, it's you, Charles. No, Sir Wilford's in court. Yes, Shuttleworth case. Won't be back just yet. Yeah, with Mars for the prosecution and Vanter trying it. He's been giving judgments for close to like two hours already. No, not an earthly disease. We're off the law. Can give you an appointment tomorrow. No, couldn't possibly. I'm expecting Mayhew of Mayhew in Brinsville, you know. Any minute now. Oh, well, so long. Shall I make the tea, Mr. Potter? It couldn't possibly be time yet, brother. It is by my watch. Then your watch is wrong. I, I put it right by the radio. Then the radio must be wrong. Oh, no, Mr. Potter, but that, that couldn't possibly be wrong. This watch was my father's. It never gains nor loses. They don't make watches like this nowadays. You're typing. Always mistakes. You've left out a word. Oh well. It's just one word. The word you've left out is not. The omission of it completely alters the thing. Who does it? That's rather funny when you come to think. It's not funny in the least. Do it again. You may recall the celebrated case I told you about me last week. A case of a will in a trust fund, owing entirely to a piece of careless copying by a clerk. Long life stuck that money at me. A woman divorced 15 years previously, absolutely contrary to the will of the testator, as his lordship himself admitted, but the wording at his stand. They couldn't do anything about it. Council's chambers are no place for laughter. The law, Greta, is a very serious matter and should be treated accordingly. You wouldn't think so to hear some of the jokes the bench has made. That sort of joke is the prerogative of the bench. Now, Greta. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Mr. Mayhew is to be here shortly. A Mr. Leonard Bull is also to be expected. They may come together or separately. Leonard Bull? Why, well, that's the name. That, it was in the paper. The tea, Greta. Ask to communicate with the Queen's last friend who was with him there. He told me. The tea! It was only last. <coughs> These girls, sensational, inaccurate. I don't know what the temple's coming to nowadays. Mr. Mayhew. Sit down, Mr. Bull. Good afternoon, Carter. Good afternoon, Mayhew. Wilford will be here shortly. He's tied up in court, but I can go over to the roping room and call him here. I'm afraid our appointment is on rather short notice, but it Seems time is of some uh, urgency. You hear what? Mr. Bull. How's the lumbago? It only bothers me when you wait to the east, but uh, thank you for remembering it, Mr. Mayhew. Sit down, Mr. Bull. Thanks. I can rather walk about. This sort of thing makes you feel a bit jumpy. Yes, yes, you very probably. Uh, uh, thanks. I don't mind if I did. Uh, no, thank you, Greta. Sorry. What I mean is, I can't believe it's me this is happening to. I keep thinking this is all some dream and I'll wake up presently. Yes, I suppose you would feel that way. Well, it just feels so silly. Silly, Mr. Bull? Well, yes. I've always been a friendly sort of chap. Get on with people and all that. 
I'm not the type of fellow that does, well, anything violent. But I suppose it'll be all right, won't it? I mean, you don't get convicted for something you haven't done in this country, do you? Our English judicial system is, in my opinion, the finest in the world. Of course, there was that case of, what was his name? Adolf Beck. I read about it only the other day. After years of being in prison, they found out there was another chap called Smith. Then they gave him a free pardon. That's the thing that seems odd to me. Getting a pardon for something you haven't done? It is the necessary legal term. Well, it doesn't seem right to me. What's important was that Mr. Beck was set at liberty. Well, yes, it was all right for him, but if it had been murder, well, if it had been murder now, it would have been too late. He would have been hanged. Now, Mr. Bull, there's no need to take such a uh, morbid line of thinking. I'm sorry, sir, but you see, I'm, I'm rather getting the wind up. Yes, yes, well, stay calm. Sir Wilfred Robards will be here soon, and I expect you to tell him your story just as you told it to me. Yes, sir. But in the meantime, I'd like to get some of the uh, pictures cleared. You aren't present, I understand, out of a job? Yes, but I've got a few pounds put by. It isn't much, but if you can see your way. No, I'm not thinking of uh, legal fees. It's just the uh, situation I want to know about. Uh, you, how long have you been on board? Oh, about a couple of months. And what did you do before that? I worked in a motor servicing firm, kind of mechanic. That's what I was. Were you discharged? No, I quit. Had to work with the foreman, proper old Beth. Mean sort of fellow, He's always picking on you. Hmm. And for that? I worked in a petrol station, but things got a bit awkward and I left. Awkward? In what way? Well, the boss's daughter, she was only a kid, but she, well, she took a bit of a fancy to me. And there was nothing there shouldn't have been between us, but the old man got a bit fed up and said I better go. He was very nice about it. Gave me a good kick, too. And before that, I was selling egg beaters on commission. Indeed. And a rotten job they were, too. I could have invented a better egg beater myself. You're thinking I'm a bit of a drifter, sir. And it's true in a way, but I'm not really like that. Doing my army service unsettled me. Well, that and being abroad. I was in Germany. It was fine there. That's where I met my wife. She's an actress. But ever since I've come back to this country, I can't seem somehow to settle down properly. I don't know what I want to do, really. I like working on cars best and coming up with new gadgets for them. That's interesting, that is. And, and you see. Hello, John! Ah, oh, Wilfred. Card show John is in court. Imagine really surpassed himself today. And this must be Mr. Uh, Bull. Mr. Leonard Bull. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Won't you have a seat? How's the family, John? Well, he's got a touch of this 24-hour flu. Too bad. Yes, damnable. Did you win your case, Wilbur? I'm quite glad to say I did. Always gives you satisfaction to beat that Myers, doesn't it? <sighs> gives me satisfaction to beat anything. Especially Myers? Especially Myers. She's quite an irritating woman. Always seems to bring out the worst in me. The failing appears to be mutual. She hates you because you'll never let her finish a sentence. Uh, for me, it's those manners of the first, yeah. <coughs> And she always calls me robots, robots. She's quite a capable advocate. If only she'd know not to ask leading questions when she knows damn well she shouldn't. <sighs> but let's get down to business. Yes. I brought Mr. Bowl here to tell you a story exactly as he told it to me. There is some urgency in the thing. Oh? My wife thinks I'm going to be arrested, and well, she's much cleverer than I am, so she may be right. Arrested for what? Well. For murder. Case of Miss Emily French. You've no doubt seen the reports in the press. A maiden lady who lived alone but for an elderly housekeeper in a house at Hampstead. On the night of October the 14th, her housekeeper came home at 11 o'clock to find that the house had been apparently broken into and ransacked, and her mistress had been tossed on the head and killed. That is right? That's right. It's quite an ordinary sort of thing to happen nowadays. And then the other day, I read in the paper that they were. The police were anxious to interview Mr. Leonard Bull, who had visited Miss French earlier on the evening in question, as they thought he might be able to provide them with some useful information. So, of course, I went along to the police station, and they asked me a lot of questions. Did, did they cost you? Well I, well, I don't quite know. I mean, they said, would I like to make a statement? 
and they write it down and, and it might be used in court. Was that functioning game? Oh well, can't be helped now. Anyway, it sounded damn silly to me, but I told them all I could, and they were very polite and seemed quite satisfied and all that. And when I got home and told Romaine about it, my wife that is, she, well, she got the wind up. She seemed to think that they, well, that they got hold of the idea that I might have done it. So I thought I ought to get hold of a solicitor, so I came to you, as I thought you might be able to tell me what I ought to do about it. Now, tell Sir Wilfred, as you just told me, how you came to make the acquaintance of Miss French. Well, it was one day in Oxford Street. I saw an old lady crossing the road carrying a lot of parcels, and, well, in the middle of the road, she dropped them. Tried to get hold of them again, and found a bus was almost on top of her. She just managed to get to the curb safely. Well, I recovered her parcels, brushed a bit of the mud off them, and tied up one of the ones that had burst open with a piece of string. It, I also soothed her down. You know the sort of thing. And she was great. Oh yes, very grateful. Thanks me a lot and all that. Anyone would have thought I'd saved her life instead of her parcels. But there was actually no question of you had it saved her life. Oh no, nothing heroic. As a matter of fact, I never expected to see her again, but by an extraordinary coincidence, two days later I was sitting behind her in the theater. And she turned around and recognized me and we began to chat. And in the invite, in the end, she invited me to come and see her. And you went? Yes. She urged me to name a day specifically, and, well, it seemed rather churlish to refuse, so I said I'd go on the following Saturday. And you went to her house at... Hampstead. Hampstead? Yes. What did you know about her when you first went? Well, nothing but what she told me, that she lived alone and hadn't very many friends. Something of that sort. She lived with only an old housekeeper. Oh, yes. She had eight cats, though. Eight of them. The house was beautifully furnished, but, well, it smelt a bit of cat. Had you reason to believe that she was little? Well, she talked as though she was. And it's you yourself. Though I'm practically stone broke and have been for quite some time. Unfortunate. Yes, it is rather. Oh, you mean to say people will think I was sucking up to her for money? Uh, well... I wouldn't have said it quite so plainly, but in essence, yes, I believe that's possibly what people might say. It isn't true, you know. As in, in fact, I felt sorry for her. She seemed lonely. I was brought up by an old aunt, my Aunt Bessie, and, and I like old ladies. Mr. Vole, you say old ladies. Do you actually know how old Miss French was? Well, I didn't, but I read it in the paper after she was murdered. It says she was 56. Fifty-six. Now you may consider that bold, uh, old, Mr. Bull, but I highly doubt Miss French considered herself old. Well, we can't call it a chicken, can you? Moving on. You would see Miss French fairly frequently, huh? Uh, yes, I should say. Once, twice a week, perhaps. Did you at all bring your wife with you? No, I didn't. And why not? Well, I don't think it would have gone down very well if I had. With your wife or with Miss French? With Miss French. She... Go on. Well, you see, she got rather fond of me. You mean she fell in love with you? Oh, good lord, no. Nothing of that sort. She just sort of pampered me and spoiled me. That sort of thing. Now, I have no doubts, Mr. Bull, that part of the police case being built against you, if there is a police case being built against you, which as of now, I have no doubt you will know. But part of the police case being built against you is why did you, young, married, reasonably good looking, Devote so much of your time to an elderly woman with whom you can have hardly much in common. Yes. I know they'll say I was after her for money, but. And perhaps in a way that's true, but only in a way. And at least your friend, Mr. Bull, could you explain a little more clearly? Well, she made no secret of the fact that she was rolling in money, and as I told you, Romaine and I are pretty hard up. So I did hope that if we ever really were truly in a tight place, that she might lend me any money. Did you ever take a loan from her? No, I didn't. I mean, things weren't desperate. Of course, I can see it does look rather bad for me. Miss French knew you were a married man? Oh, yes. But she never asked you to bring your wife? No, she, she seemed to take it for granted that my wife and I didn't get on. 
Did you deliberately give her that impression? No, I didn't. Indeed, I didn't. But she seemed to, well, assume it, and I didn't want to drag Romaine into it, as I thought she might, well, lose interest in me. I didn't want exactly to cash money from her, but, but you see, I'd invented this new gadget for the car, a really good one it is, and I thought perhaps if I could have persuaded her to invest, well, it would have been her money, and it might have brought her in a lot. Though it's very difficult to explain. I wasn't sponging on her, Sir Wilfred. Really, I wasn't. What amounts of money did you obtain from her at any time? None. None at all. Tell me something about the housekeeper. Janet McKenzie. She was a regular old tyrant, Janet was. Fairly bullied poor Miss French. Poor dear, uh, poor dear couldn't call her soul her own when Janet was around. Janet didn't like me at all. Why didn't she like you? Oh, jealous, I expect. She didn't like me helping Miss French with her business affairs. Oh, so you helped Miss French with your business affairs? Yes. She found it a bit difficult to fill up forms, and she was worried about some of her investments and things. So, yes, I helped her with a lot of things like that. Now, Mr. Bull, I'm going to ask you a very serious question, one to which is vital that I should have a truthful answer. Now, you were in low water financially. You had the handle of this old world of securities. Now, did you, at any point, convert to your own use of securities that you can handle? Now, wait a minute. Before you answer this, Bull, for you see that there are two points of view. Either we make a feature of your probity and honesty, or if you swindle the woman in any way, we take the line that you had no motive for murder since you already had a profitable source of income. You can see there are advantages to either point of view. I assure, I assure you, Sir Wilfred, that I play dead straight, and you won't find anything to the contrary. Dead straight. Thank you. You relieve my mind very much. I pay you the compliments to thinking that you are too intelligent to lie over such a vital matter. Now, that brings us to the night of October the... 14th. 14th. Did Miss French ask you to go and see her? No, she didn't, as a matter of fact, but i come across a new gadget that I thought she might like, so I slipped up there about a quarter to eight. It was Janet McKenzie's night out, and I knew she'd be alone, and, well, I thought she'd be look rather lonely. It was Janet McKenzie's night out, and you knew that fact? Yes. I knew Janet always went out on a Friday. That's not quite so good. Why not? It should seem very natural that I choose that night to go and see her. Please continue, Mr. Will. Well, I arrived there about a quarter to eight, and she had finished her supper, but we shared a cup of coffee, and then we played a game of Double Demon. And at nine o'clock, I said goodnight to her, and I went straight home. You told me the housekeeper said she came home early that night. Yes. Uh, the police said that she came home for something she'd forgotten, and she heard, or, well, she says she heard someone talking with Miss French. Well, whoever it was, it wasn't me. Can you prove that, Mr. Yes, of course I can prove it. I was at home with my wife by then. Uh, that's what the police kept asking me, where I was at 9.30. Well, some days, one wouldn't quite know where one was, but as a matter of fact, I remember quite clearly that I'd gone straight home to Romaine and he hadn't gone out again. You live in a flat? Yes. We've got a tiny masonette uh, over a shop behind Houston State. Did anyone see you returning to this flat? I don't suppose so. Why should they? It might have been an advantage if they had. But surely you don't think. I mean, if she really were killed at half past nine, then my wife's evidence is all I need. Isn't it? And your wife will definitely say you were home at that time. Yes, of course she will. You're quite fond of your wife, and she is quite fond of you. Romaine's absolutely devoted to me. She's the most devoted wife any man could have. I see. You are happily married. Couldn't be happier. Romaine's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And I'd like you to know her, Mr. Mayfield. <laughs> yes, come in. Uh, oh, thank you, Greta. Uh, would I make you like any tea? Uh, no, thank you, Greta. Oh! Mr. Gold, would you like some tea? No, thank you, sir. No, thank you. I think it would be advisable for us to have a meeting with your wife. You mean have a regular round table conference? Mr. Bull, I wonder if you're taking this quite seriously enough. I am. I am, really. It's, it just seems so much like a bad dream that, that it should be happening to me. 
murder. It's a thing you read about in books and newspapers, but you never imagine it happening to you or touching you in any way. I suppose that's why I keep trying to make a joke of it, but it isn't a joke, really. No, I'm afraid it isn't a joke. But, I mean, it's all right, isn't it? If she really were killed at half past nine, and I was at home with Romaine. Did, did you go home by bus or underground? I walked. Did you see anyone you knew on your way? Hmm. Uh, I don't think so, but Romaine. Mr. Vole, the evidence for life, unsupported by any other evidence, is not the most admissible in court. You mean to say that they think she'd tell a lie on my account? It has been known, Mr. Vole. Though I'm sure she would too. Only in this case, it wouldn't be a lie. It really is so. You do believe me, don't you? I believe you, Mr. Vole. It is not me who have to convince. You are aware, are you not, that Miss French left a will leaving you all of her money? Left all of her money to me? You're joking. I'm not joking. It's in the evening paper. Well, I can hardly believe it. You had no idea of this? No. She never said a word. You're quite sure of that? Yes. Absolutely sure. I'm very grateful to her, yet, in a way, perhaps now I wish that she had it. It is a bit unfortunate as things are. It supplies you with a very adequate motive. Miss French never mentioned anything about the new will to you? No. She said to Janet once, You're afraid I shall make my will again, but there was nothing about me. It was just a bit of a dust up between them. Do you really think they're going to arrest me? I think. I think we should be prepared for that eventuality. I, you'll do the best you can for me, won't you, sir? Rest assured, my boy, I will do everything in my power to make sure that you are okay. Just leave it all in my hands. And you'll look after Romaine, too. She'll be in an awful state. It'll be terrible for her. Don't worry, my boy. Don't worry. And the money side, too. That worries me. That's got a few quid, but it isn't much. Perhaps I shouldn't have asked you to do anything for me. I think we shall be able to put up an adequate case. The court does provide for these types of cases, you know. I can hardly believe it. I can hardly believe that I, Leonard Vole, will be standing in a dock saying, not guilty, people staring at me. I can't see why they didn't think it was a burglar. The paper said the window was smashed and things were strewn about. It seems so much more probable. This must have some reason to not believe it was a burglar. Well, it seems to me. Yes, sir. What is it? Excuse me, sir. There are two gentlemen here asking for Mr. Bull. The police? Yes, sir. I'll go talk to them, John. My God. Is this it? It may be, my boy. But take it easy. Don't lose heart. Make no further statements. Keep it all to us. How did they know I was here? Seems probable they've had a man watching you. Then they really do suspect me. Sorry to bother you. This is Mr. Leonard Bull. Is your name Leonard Bull? Yes, it is. I have heard one for your arrest for the charge of murder, and we pray till October 14th last. I must warn you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence. Okay. I'm ready. Good afternoon, Inspector. My name is Mayhew. I'm representing Mr. Bull. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayhew. That's quite all right. I'll take him along with Carrie Jean. Carrie sees the weather we're having just now. Quite a little frost last night. We'll be seeing you later, sir, I expect. Hope we haven't inconvenienced you. I'm never inconvenienced. I will say, John, that boy is a bit more trouble than you seem to think. It certainly is. How does he strike you? Extraordinarily naive. And yet, in some ways, Quite true, intelligent, I should say. But he doesn't seem to understand the danger of his position. Do you think he did it? In all, I should say not. You agree? I agree. Well, he seems to have impressed both of us favorably. I can't imagine why. I've never heard a weaker story. And the only evidence we have to go off with is that of his wife. Who is going to believe a wife? It has been known to happen. And she's a foreigner. Nine out of twelve in a jury box will think she's lying anyway. She'll be 
emotional and she'll be upset. She won't understand what the prosecuting counsel is asking. You'll see, she'll be having hysterics all over my chambers. Perhaps you prefer not to accept the brief. Who says I won't accept the brief? Just because the boy has an absolute Tom fool of a story to tell. But it's a true one. It must be true. It couldn't be so idiotic if it weren't. But all the facts down in black and white, the whole thing is utterly damning. And yet, when the boy speaks these damning facts to you, you believe everything he says, and everything that happened just as he said it did. <sighs> Damn it! I am not Betsy myself. I love you dearly. He's got a good personality, I think. Sympathetic. That will go down well with the jury, but it will cut absolutely no ice with the judge. Still, we'll have to interview this woman. A lot depends on this girl, Mayfield. Come in. Mrs. Byer Bowles here. Mrs. Bowles? Come here. You saw that man outside. He's just been arrested for murder. I know. Isn't it exciting? Do you think he did it? Sure he did. Why not? He's far too nice. That makes three of us. Thank you, brother. Please bring Mrs. Bowl in. We may be three credulous fools, all taken in by a young man with a pleasing personality. Miss Bowles. My dear Mrs. Bowles. Oh, you are Mr. Mayfield? Yes. This is Sir Wilfred Robart. He is pleased to handle your husband. Well, what are you doing so much, sir? How are you doing? I've just come from your office, Mr. Mayhew. They told me you were here with my husband? Quite, quite. Just as I arrived, I thought I saw Lena getting into a car. Now, Is there my, about two men with him? My dear Mrs. Bowen, you must not upset yourself. Please, won't you have a seat? Thanks. Now, what I say to you may surprise you, but you must not give way. Oh, no. I shall not give way. Then I shall say, as you may have already suspected, your husband has just been arrested. For the murder of Miss Emily Frank? Yes, I'm afraid so. But please, do not be upset. You keep saying that so, Wilfred, but I am not upset. No. No, I see that you have a great fortitude. You can call it that if you like. The important thing is to stay calm and tackle all of this sensibly. That suits you very well, but you must not hide anything from Mr. Silver. You must not try and stun me. I want to know everything. I want to know the worst. Splendid. Uh, splendid. Um, that's the right thing to tackle things. Now, my dear lady, we're not going to give away to alarm or despondency. We're going to tackle everything in a straightforward and calm manner. Now, May, Miss French became friendly with your husband about six weeks ago. You were um, aware of that friendship? He told me that he had rescued an old lady and her parcels one day in the middle of a crowded street. He told me that he had asked him to go and see her. And he did go and see her? Yes. And they became great friends? Evidently. There was no question of you accompanying your husband on any of these visits? Well, I thought it better not. Yes, and just between you and I, why? Yes, yes. We can get into that another time. So, Leonard became good friends with Mrs. French. He did her various tasks around the house. She was an old woman with a lot of time on her hands, and she found your husband's friendship quite congenial. Leonard can be very charming. Yes, I'm sure he can. I'm sure he felt, no doubt, that it would kind of be acting on his part to go and cheer up the old lady. I guess so. You didn't at all object to this friendship? I do not think I objected, no. Knowing him as well as you do, you have perfect trust in your husband. Yes, I know that very well. I admire your calm and courage in all of this, Mrs. Bowles. Knowing as well as I do, how devoted you are to your husband. So you know how devoted I am to him? But of course! something of your own knowledge? You do not know how devoted I am to Leonard of your own knowledge, do you, Sir Wilfred? No, no, that is of course true, but your husband told me. Leonard told you how devoted
Lord said, I was to him? Yes, he spoke of your devotion to the most moving of things. Men, I often think, are very stupid. I beg your pardon? It does not matter. Please, go on. Miss French was an old woman, a very wealthy old woman. Like many other eccentric old women, she was very fond of making wills. After some small requests, she left the whole of her fortune to your husband. Yes? You were aware of that fact. I read it in the papers this evening. Yes, but before reading it, you had no idea of that fact. Your husband had no idea of that fact. Is that what he told you? You don't suggest anything different. No, no, I do not suggest anything. There seems to be no doubt that Miss French looked on your husband in the most favorable way. That of a son, or maybe a very favorite nephew. Do you think Miss French looked upon Leonard as a son? Yes, I think so. Definitely, I think so. I think that could be regarded as most natural in circumstances. What a hypocrite you are in this country! My dear Mrs. Paul! I shock you? I am so sorry. No, no, of course, you have a very continental way of looking at these things. That being said, that is not the line to take. I assure you, you should in no way infer that there are any feelings between Miss French and your husband, other than that of a mother or an aunt. No, by all means, let's say an aunt, if you think it best. One must think of the effect of the jury in this matter, Mr. Wall. Yes, I also think to do that. I've been thinking about that a great deal. Yes, well, we must work together on this. That brings us the night of October the 14th. Your husband called on Miss French that night. He went over to her house and played a game of double demon before taking leave of her at around 9 o'clock. He uh, walked home on foot, arriving back at home with you at 9.25. 25 minutes past 9. Janet McKenzie, the housekeeper, arrived at the house at 9.30. She walked by the sitting room door because she had left something, and this is where she heard a voice in conversation with Miss French. She assumed this voice was that of Leonard Bull, and that is the statement that the police have used to arrest your husband. But Leonard says that there is no way he was there because he has an absolute alibi being home with you at 9.30. That is true, is it not? He was home with you at 9.30. That is what Leonard says, that he was home with me at 9.30? Is it true? But of course! Possibly the police have already questioned you on that point. Oh yes, they came to see me yesterday evening. And you said? I said, let him go home with me at 9.30 and did not go out again. You said, oh. That was right, was it not? What do you mean by that, Mrs. Bull? That is what I was wanting to say. That's the truth. You said so just now. I have to understand. Do we show up? If I say yes, that Leonard was home with me at 9.30, will they acquit him? If what you both say is true, then they will have to acquit him. But when I said that to the police, I do not think they believed me. Why don't you think they believed you? Perhaps I did not say it very well. Mrs. Bull, I don't quite understand your attitude at all of this. So you don't understand? Well, perhaps it is difficult. Perhaps your husband's position is not clear. I have already told you I want to understand fully just how black the case against my husband is. I said to the police, Nana came in at 9.30 and they did not believe me. So perhaps there was someone who saw him leave Miss Fresh's house or who was someone on the street on his way home. Your husband did not think of anything of that kind. So it will be his more than mine. That's mine. Thank you. That is what I wanted to know. This is all. Please don't go. Not by me. And why not, Mrs. Ball? I have not to swear, so I not to speak the truth, and all the truth, and nothing but the truth. That is the oath you take. And perhaps the man is going to ask me when did Leonard Ball come home that night. I should say. You should say. There are so many things that I could say. Mrs. Ball, do you love your husband? Leonard says I do. Leonard Ball believes so. But Leonard is not very clever. You are aware, Mrs. Bull, that you cannot by law be called to give testimony damaging to your husband. How oh, very convenient. Yes, but your husband he himself. Is not my husband. What do you mean by that? Then I'm bold, it's not my husband. He went to a former marriage with me and Irene and brought me out of the Russian zone, then brought me to this country. But 
I did not tell him. I had a husband living at the time. Leonard Vol brought you out of the Russian sector and into this country. You should be grateful, are you? One can get tired of gratitude. Has Leonard Vol ever injured you in any way? Leonard? Injured me? He worships the god of Vodka. And you yourself? You want to know too much. Mrs. Vol, your statements have been very ambiguous as of yet. What happened on the night of October? Leonard came in at 25 minutes past 9 and did not go out again. I have given him an alibi, have I not? That you have. You're a very remarkable woman, Mrs. Wall. And you are satisfied, I hope. I'll be damned if I'm satisfied. Nor I. That woman's up to something, John. I don't like it, but what? She certainly hasn't gone into hysterics. Cool as a cucumber. Going to happen if we get her into that witness box. God knows. The prosecution will break her down in no time, especially if it's Myers. It's not the Attorney General, it probably will be. Then what's your line of attack? Same as it always is. Keep interrupting as many objections as possible. What beats me is that young Mr. Bolt is completely convinced of her devotion. Don't put your trust in that. Any woman can fool a man if she wants to, and if he's in love with her. He's in love with her. Trust her completely. More for he. Never trust a woman. Lady, the queen, and the prisoner at the bar, whom I shall have in charge, and a true verdict give according to the evidence. Thank you. 
conclusion that Miss Emily Jane French was murdered between 9.30 and 10 on the evening of October the 14th of last by a blow from a cosh, and that that blow was delivered by the prisoner, Leonard Bull. I will now call Inspector Hearn. when you received an emergency call? Yes, sir. What did you do? Sergeant Randall, I was 23 at Springfield. I was admitted to the house and established that the occupant, whom I later ascertained was Miss Emily French, was dead. She was lying on her face and had received severe blows to the back of her head. A an attempt had been made to force one of the windows open with some implement that might have been a pistol. The window was broken near the cat. There was blood strewn about the floor, inside and outside the window. Is there any particular significance in trying to glass both inside and outside the window? The glass outside was not consistent with the window having been forced from the outside. So you're saying that if the window had been forced from the inside, there had been an attempt to make it look as though it had been done from the outside. I object. My learned friend is putting words into the witness's mouth. She really must observe the rules of evidence. You've been engaged in many cases of burglary, housebreaking. <laughs> In your experience, when the window is forced from the outside, where is the glass? On the inside. And in any other case where the window has been forced from the outside, have you ever found fragments of glass outside the window, on the ground, some distance below? No. No. Will you go on? A search is made, photographs are taken, and the house of fingerprints. What fingerprints did you discover? Those of Miss Emily French, those of Janet McKenzie, and some which later proved to be a prisoner, Mr. Leonard Cole. No others? No others. Did you really think that a burglary had occurred? Or you say, you say the room had the appearance of a burglar having been committed. That is just what the inspector did not say. My lord, if you remember, there was a point made quite improperly made by I asked, to which I had objected. You are quite right, Mr. Wilfred. At the same time, I'm not sure the inspector is not entitled to the evidence of fact that may tend to prove that the disorder in the room was not the work of a person who broke into the outside for the purpose of robbery. My lord, I must respectfully agree with what your lordship has said. Facts, yes, but not the mere expression of opinion without the facts on which it is based. Perhaps, my lord, if I phrase my question in this way, my friend would be satisfied. Inspector, based on what you saw, could you say whether there had or had not been a bona fide breaking in from the outside of the really, house? my lord, I must continue my objection. Yes, Miss Myers, I'm afraid you'll have to do a little better. Did you find anything inconsistent with the breaking in, with the breaking in having occurred from the outside? Only the glass. Nothing else? Nothing. We all seem to have drawn a blank there, Miss Myers. Was Miss French wearing jewelry of any value? She was wearing a diamond brooch, two diamond earrings, valued at about 900 pounds. And these were left untouched? Yes, ma'am. Was in fact anything taken? No. And in your experience, when anyone breaks into a house, do they usually leave without taking anything? Not unless they're interrupted. But in this case, it doesn't seem as if the burglar was interrupted. No, ma'am. Do you produce a jacket, Inspector? Yes, ma'am. From where did you get it? I found it from his flight sometime after he was arrested. I took it down to Mrs. Clay to test the possible bloodstain. Lastly, Inspector, do you produce the will of Miss Emily French? Yes, Dated October the 8th? Yes, ma'am. And after certain bequests, the residue was left entirely to the prisoner, Leonard Bull. Yes. And what is the net value of that estate? It will be as far as can be ascertained at the moment, 85,000 pounds. Now, Inspector Hurd, you say that the only fingerprints found inside the house were that of Miss French herself, Janet McKenzie, and the prisoner, Leonard Bull. Now, in the case of a burglar, would the burglar wear gloves, or would he leave fingerprints behind? He wears gloves. Invariably? So the absence of fingerprints in the case of a burglary would hardly surprise you. No. Mm. Now, you say that there were chisel marks. Were these chisel marks on the inside or the outside of the case? On the outside. Now, wouldn't that be consistent with and only consistent with a break-in from the outside? No. Oh? He could have gone outside afterwards and made those marks, or he could have made those marks from the inside. From the inside, Inspector. Now, pray tell, how would he have done that? 
There are two windows there, both are casements. You could have opened one side, leaned out, and made those marks from the end. Hmm. Now, was there any chisel found there around the premises or the prisoner's flat? Yes, sir. Oh? But those are not specific marks on the window. Hmm. Now, it was a windy night, October the 14th, was it not? I can't really remember, sir. Now, my learned friend has said Jenna Kenzie pointed out that the curtains were blowing about. Perhaps you remember that fact. Indicating that it was a windy night. Now, let's take the line that some burglar forced open the window from the outside. It is possible the wind, blowing as violently as it was that night, blew it back, just causing it to swing back out and cause some loose flat to fall on the outside of the casement. That's entirely possible, is it not? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Violent crime, as we have all been unhappy to wear, has been much on the rise of late. Yes, sir. That is true. Now, let's take the line that some young thugs broke into Miss Merchant's house with the intent to attack. And steal from her. It's possible that after cautioning her on the pilot and finding that she had died, that they might give way to panic and leave without taking anything. Or perhaps they were looking for money and wouldn't touch anything in the line of jewels. I submit that it is impossible for the inspector to guess at what might have been going on in the minds of some entirely hypothetical young criminals who may not even exist. <clears throat> now, is it true that the prisoner has protested his innocence since his arrest? Yes, sir. And when you took him down to the station and made a statement, he did so quite willingly. Inspector, would you kindly examine that knife? You recognize that knife, perhaps? I may. I believe it is the knife that was taken off the kitchen table in the prisoner's flat. My lord, to save the time of the court, may I say that we accept this knife as a knife being in the possession of Leonard Bull and shown to the inspector by Mrs. Bull. That's correct, Inspector? Yes, sir. It is what is known as a French vegetable knife, I believe. It may be. Go ahead and test the edge of the blade carefully with your finger. You will agree that both the edge and points are razor sharp. Yes, sir. Sharp enough to say if you were cutting hand carving it, that is, you may be able to inflict quite a nasty wound on yourself, one which might bleed profusely. Yes? I object! That is a matter of opinion, and medical opinion at that. I withdraw my question. I will instead ask that if on the first interview with Leonard Ball, he directed your attention to a recently healed scar on his wrist. He did, sir. And when you interviewed his wife, she said the same thing? The first time. Afterwards. A simple yes or no will suffice, Inspector. Did she say the same thing? Yes, she did. Mm. What first drew your attention to that jacket, Inspector? I believe it was because it recently been washed. And you were told this story about an accident with a kitchen knife? Yes, ma'am. And your attention was drawn to a scar on the prisoner's wrist? Yes. Now, of course, that scar was made by this there was nothing to show whether it had been an accident or had been done deliberately. I object, my learned friend, is again seeking to obtain an opinion from the witness. I withdraw the question. Thank you, Inspector. Dr. Wyatt? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are a police surgeon attached to the Hampstead Division. Yes. Dr. Wyatt, will you kindly tell the jury what you know regarding the death of Miss Emily French? On October 14th, at 11 o'clock p.m., I saw the body had subsequently proved to be Miss French. Death had resulted from a blow on the head, delivered from an object such as a cosh. Death would have been instantaneous from temperature and other factors that placed the time of death in between 9.30 and 10 p.m. Had Miss French struggled with her adversary at all? Well, there was no evidence that she had done so. I would say quite the contrary. She was taken quite unprepared. Now, Dr. Wyatt, from the position of the blow that had been struck, there was only one blow, was there not? Only one on the left side of the exterior. Yes, and where is that? Uh, the exterior, the junction of parietal, occipital, and temple bone. <laughs> yes, and in layman's language, that would be? Oh, uh, behind the left ear. Now, would that imply the blow had been struck by a left-handed person? It's difficult to say. The blow had been struck directly from behind, because the bruising ran perpendicularly. I would say it's impossible to say whether it delivered from a left-handed or right-handed man. Now, Dr. Wyatt, we don't yet know that it was a man who struck the blow. But, if anything, you would say that it is more possible that you struck it from a left-handed person, yes? It's maybe, but I would say it's uncertain. 
Now, from the position of the blow, would blood have gotten on the hand or arm that struck it? That's possible. And exclusively on the hand or arm? Probably only on, on the hand and arm, but it's difficult to be dogmatic. Mm -hmm. Now, would great strength have been required to strike such a blow? No. No <laughs> great strength would have been needed. So, a man or a woman could have equally done so? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Call Janet McKenzie? Janet McKenzie. Janet McKenzie. Your other hand, please. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Your name is Jennifer Kenzie? Hi, that's my name. You were a companion housekeeper to the late Miss Emily French. I was her housekeeper. I have no opinion of companions. Poor Rebecca Savali is afraid to do a bit of honest domestic work. Quite so, quite so. I meant only that you were held in esteem and affection by Miss French. You were on good terms, not quite those of mistress and servant. Twenty years I've been with her and looked after her. She knew me and she trusted me. And then it's the time I prevented her from doing a foolish action. Miss Mackenzie, would you please? your remarks to the jury. What sort of a person was Miss French? She was a warm hearted body, too warm hearted at times from thinking, a wee bit impulsive too. There'd be times when she'd have no sense at all. She was easily flattered, you see. When did you first see the prisoner? Leonard Vol. He came to the house, I mind, at the end of August. How often did he come? To begin at once a week, but later with oftener. Two and even three times he She'd quarrel up with the people, then she'd come home, tear up the will, 
When did she make her last will? She made it on October the 8th. I heard her speaking to Mr. Stokes, the lawyer, saying he was to come tomorrow. She was making a new will. And he was there. I mean, the prisoner kind of protesting, saying, no, no. But the mistress said, but I want to, my dear boy. I want to. Remember that time I was nearly ran over by a bus? It could happen at any time. Do you know when your mistress made a will previous to that one? In the spring it was. Were you aware, Miss Mackenzie, that Leonard Wool was a married man? No, indeed. Neither was the mistress. I object what Miss French did or did not know is pure conjecture on Janet Mackenzie's part. Let's put it this way. You formed the opinion that Miss French thought Leonard Wool a married man. A, a single man. Have you any facts to support that opinion? There's the book she'd ordered from the library. There was the life of Baroness Burdett Coots, and a one about Ms. Braley and his wife. Both that woman who married men years younger than us. I knew what she was thinking. I'm afraid you did not admit that. Why? Members of the jury, it's possible for a woman to read the life of Ms. Braley without contemplating marriage with a man younger than herself. Did Mr. Bull ever mention a wife? Never. Thank you. Now, Miss Mackenzie, I think we all appreciate how very devoted to your mistress you were. I, I was. You had, of course, great influence over her. I, maybe. So, in the last one that your you made, that is to say, the one made last spring, you were left all of her money. Were you aware of this? She told me so. All crooks, these charities, expenses here and expenses there, and the money not going to the object you give it for. I left it to you, Janet, and you can do what you think is right and good with it. Now, that was an expression of great trust on her part, I think. As I understand it, in the present will, you've been left merely an annuity, with the principal beneficiary being the prisoner, Leonard Ball. It would be wicked injustice if he ever touches a penny of that money. Now, you've said that Miss French had not many friends or acquaintances. Now, why was this? She didn't go out much. So, when she struck up this friendship with the prisoner, it must have made you very sore and angry, didn't it? I didn't like seeing my dear lady imposed upon. But you said it yourself, you did not impose upon her. Perhaps what you wish to say is that you didn't like seeing someone else supplant you as a primary influence over Miss French. She leaned on him a good deal. Far more than was safe, I thought. Far more than you personally liked. Of course, I just said so. But it was a fur bed, I was thinking. So the prisoner had a great influence over Miss French, and she had a great affection for him. That's what it had come to. So if the prisoner had ever asked for any money, he almost certainly would have received some. I have not said that. But he never did receive any money, did he? That may not have been for want of trying. Returning to the night of October the 14th, you say that you heard the prisoner talking to this French. What did they say? I didn't hear what they actually said. You just heard voices, the murmur of voices. They were laughing. You heard a man and a woman laugh. Is that right? I. I suggest that is exactly what you did hear. A man and a woman laughing. What makes you so sure one of those voices was Leonard Bull? I know his voice well enough. The door was closed, was it not? Aye, it was closed. So you heard a man and a woman laughing behind a closed door, and you swear one of them was Leonard Bull. I suggest that is mere prejudice on your part. It was Leonard Bull! Now, as I understand it, you passed the sitting room door twice, once coming in and once returning out. That's so. You were in, no doubt, a hurry to get your pattern to your friend. I was in no particular hurry. I had the whole evening. What I'm trying to suggest is that on both occasions of passing the door, you passed it rather quickly. I was there long enough to hear what I heard. Oh, now come, Miss Mackenzie. I'm sure you don't wish to suggest to the jury that you were eavesdropping. I was doing no such thing. I have better things to do with my time. Exactly. Now, as I understand it, you were registered under the National Health Insurance Act. That's so. Four and six pecks I took out every week. That's a terrible lot of money for a working woman to pay. Yes, I'm sure many people will deal with that plan. As I also understand that you recently applied for a national hearing that you had. Four, six months ago I applied for one. I have not got it yet. Mm. So your hearing isn't very good. When I say to you that you could not possibly have heard the man and the woman talking behind a closed door, what do you say? Can you tell me what I just said? I did not hear anyone if they mumble. And in fact, you did not hear me, even though I'm standing just a few feet away from you in an open court. Yet you swear that behind a closed door with two people talking in an ordinary, conversational tone, you make out the voice of one Leonard Ball. It was him, I tell you, it was him. What you're saying is you want it to be him. You have a preconceived notion. Who else could it have been? Exactly. Who else could it have been? Now, was Miss French lonely? by herself in the evenings? No, 
Oh, she was not lonely. She had the books in the library. Ah, uh, yes, the books. Perhaps you'd like to listen to the wireless. Aye, she listened to the wireless. She had maybe a favorite talk show or enjoyed a good play. Yes, yeah, she liked a good play. Isn't it possible that what you heard that night was a man and a woman laughing, talking on the wireless? There was a play on that night. I think it was called Mother's Leap. It was not the wireless. Then why not? The wireless was a way of being repaired that week. Ah! <clears throat> uh, it must have made you very upset if you thought Miss French was really going to marry you. Naturally, it would upset me. It was a daft thing to do. Yes, and it's entirely possible that if he did marry her, he may try to persuade her, dismiss you. She wouldn't have done that. After all these years... Oh, but you never really do know what somebody might do, especially when they're being influenced by somebody else. He would have used influence. Oh, yes, he would have done his best to get rid of me. I see. So he was a very real menace to your present way of life at the time. He'd have changed everything. It is very unsettling. No wonder you feel so bitterly against the prisoner. <clears throat> My learned friend has been a great pain to extract from you and a vision of vindictiveness towards the prisoner. A painless extraction, really quite painless. Did you really believe that your mistress might have married the prisoner? Indeed I did. I just said so. Indeed you have. In your view, had the prisoner such influence over Miss French that he could have persuaded her to dismiss you? I'd like to have seen him try. He'd have not succeeded. Had the prisoner ever shown any dislike of you in any way? No, he had his manner. Just one more question, Miss McKenzie. You say you recognize Leonard Bull's voice through a closed door. Will you tell the jury how you knew it was his? You know a person's voice without hearing exactly what they're saying. Thank you. Good morning. Call Thomas in the class. Now, you say that there was blood on both cups? Yes, it was on this one. It was only the left cup. Ah, only the left cup. Now, had both cups been washed? Yes. Hmm. Now, were you aware that when the police first interviewed Leonard Bull, he directed their attention to a cut on his wrist? To some extent. Now, I have here a certificate from North London Hospital where Leonard Bull is a donor, and he is of blood type O, the same type of the blood that was tested, yes? Yes. So it is entirely possible that this blood was that of his own. That is so. Thank you. Tyler. 
against the man you have been calling your husband? I'm quite sure. Romaine, what are you doing here? What are you saying? I must have silence. Your counsel will tell you all. You will soon have the opportunity to speak in your own defense. In any event, Mrs. Hauser, will you tell the jury in your own words the events of October the 14th? I was told all that he did. On Leonard Bull? He went out at half past seven. When did he return? At ten minutes past ten. That's not true. You know it's not true. It was about 9.25 when I got home. Who's been making you say this? I don't understand. I don't understand. Leonard Bull returned, you say, at ten minutes past ten. What happened next? He was breathing hard, very excited. He threw off his coat and examined the sleeve. He told me to wash them. There are blood on them. Did he mention the blood? Yes, he said, damn it, there's blood on them. What did you say to that? He said, what have you done? And what did the prisoner say? He said, I killed her. Th that's not true. I never said that. Please, control yourself. It's not true, I tell you. You know what you're saying, Miss Hauser. I am to speak the truth, am I not? The prisoner said to you, I have killed her. Did you know to whom he referred? I knew her, yes. But that old woman she had been going to see so often. And what happened next? He, he said to say that she was home all that evening. Especially, he said, I heard to say, that she was home at 9.30. I, I say to him, do the police know what you have done? And he says, no. They will seek into the burglary. But remember, I was home with you at 9.30. And were you subsequently interrogated by the police? Yes. Did they ask you if Leonard Bull was home with you at half past nine? What did you tell them? I said that he was. But you have changed your story now. Why? Because it is murder. I cannot go and lie to save him. I'm grateful to him, yes. He married me and brought me to this country. Everything he has asked me to do, always I have done it because I was grateful. Because you loved him? No, I never loved him. Romaine. Oh, I never loved him. You were grateful to the prisoner because he brought you to this country. So when he asked you to give him an alibi, originally you consented. But later, he felt that what he had asked you to do was wrong. Yes, that is it exactly. Why do you feel it was wrong? When it is murder, I cannot come into court and lie and say he was with me at the time it was done. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. So what did you do? I did not know what to do. I do not know his country, and I'm afraid of the police. So I write a letter to my ambassador. I say, I do not wish to tell any more lies. I wish to speak the truth. That is the truth. The Leonard Bull returned home at ten minutes past ten, that he had blood on his clothes, and that he definitely admitted to you that he had killed her. That is the truth before God? That is the truth. Now, when the prisoner underwent this so-called form of marriage, was he aware that your other husband was still alive? No. He acted in good faith? Yes. And you were grateful to him? I was grateful to him, yes. So you've shown your gratitude by coming into court today and testifying against him? I have to speak the truth. Is it the truth? Yes. I suggest that this entire story of yours is some wicked fabrication, born out of a grudge that you have against the prisoner for some reason, and this is your way of expressing it. No. You appreciate you are still under oath? Yes. I warn you, Miss Hyonair, even if you do not care for the prisoner, you should be wary of that for yourself. The penalty for perjury is petty. My lord, I do not know whether these theatrical hours are for the benefit of the jury, but I do most respectfully submit that there is nothing to suggest that this witness has spoken anything but the truth. Now, you say that there was blood on both cups. Yes. Both cups. I have told you, that is what I have said. No, you said he told me to wash his cups. They had blood on them. That is precisely my note, sir. Thank you. So you washed the cups. It is my friend's turn to be an actor now, my lord. Nowhere has his witness said that she washed both cups, or in fact, that she washed even one. My learned friend is correct. So, did you wash the sleeves? 
Now, Mr. Bull, we have heard much of your friendship with Miss Emily French. Now, I want you to tell us how often you visited her. Frequently. Why was that? She was very kind to me. She was like my Aunt Betsy. That was an old aunt who had brought you up. Yes. She was a dear. Miss French reminded me of her. Now, you've heard Jen McKenzie say that Miss French thought you were a single man, and there was some question of marrying you. Is there any truth in this? Of course not. It's an absurd idea. Miss French, of course, knew you were married. Yes, she did. So there was no question of marriage between you? Of course not. I have just said so. She treated me as though she were an indulgent aunt, almost like a mother. And in return, you did everything that you could for her? Yes. Now, will you tell us in your own words what exactly happened on the night of October the 14th? Well, I'd come across a new kind of a cat brush, a new thing in that line, and I thought Miss French would enjoy it, so I took it up there that evening. I had nothing else to do. And what time was that? Just before eight, I got there. I brought it to Miss French, and she tried it out on one of the cats. And then we shared a cup of coffee, and then we played a game of double demon. Miss French was very fond of double demon. Yes, but and then, did and you not, in return, after doing that fact? Sir, Sir Wilfred, I, I don't understand this piece of evidence at all. What is a cat brush? It's a, it's a brush for brushing cats. Oh, a sort of brush and comb combined. A new thing in that line. Miss French kept cats, eight of them she had, and, well, the house smelt a bit. Listen, listen, yes, yes, please continue with your story. I thought Miss Fr it would be useful to Miss French. Yes, uh, did you see Janet McKenzie? No, Miss French let me in herself. Did you know it was Janet McKenzie's night out? Well, I didn't really think about it. What time did you leave? Uh, just before nine, and I walked home. And how long did that take? I should say between 20 minutes to half an hour. So that you arrived home? At 
9.25. Now, was your wife, I will call her your wife, there when you were at? Yes, she was. I, I, I don't understand. Never mind that now. Just answer my next question. How do you get the storage space? Did you wash your coat when you got it? No, I didn't. Who did wash your coat? Romaine did the next morning. She said it got blood on it from a uh, cut on my wrist. A cut on your wrist? Yes, here. You can still see the mark. Ah. Now, when you first heard of the murder, when did you first hear of the murder? I read it in the evening paper the next night. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel? I was shocked. I was, I was upset, too, because at least I got rather fond of her. I always thought it was a burglary. I never imagined it was something else. What happened next? I read that the police were anxious to interview me, so I went along to the police station. You went along to the police station and made a statement? Yes. You were nervous, reluctant to do so? No, of course not. I wanted to help in any way possible. Hmm. Now, you've heard your wife, or the woman who called herself your wife, you've heard the evidence she'd given in court. Yes, I heard. I, I, I Mr. Gold, I realize that you were very upset by this, but I want to ask you to put aside all emotion and to answer my next question plainly and simply. Was what that witness said true or untrue? No, of course it wasn't true. You went home to your wife at 9.30 and had supper with her. Yes. You did not go out again. Yes. Are you right or left-handed? Right-handed. I'm going to ask you one more question, Mr. Ball. Did you kill Emily French? No, I didn't kill her. Thank you. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to get money out of anybody? No. How soon into your friendship with Miss French did you learn that she was a very wealthy woman? Well, I didn't know she was rich when I first went to see her. But having gained this knowledge, you decided to cultivate her acquaintance further? I suppose that's what it looked like, but I tell you I liked her. Money had nothing to do with it. So you would have continued to see her no matter how poor she'd been? Yes, I would. You yourself are in poor circumstances? You know I am. Kindly answer the question, yes or no. You must answer the question, yes or no. Yes. What salary do you earn? Well, I haven't got a job at the moment. I haven't had one for some time. You were recently discharged from your position? No, I quit. How much money had you in the bank at the time of your arrest? I had only a few quid, but but I was expecting some more in, in a week or two. How much? Not very much. I put it to you, you were pretty desperate for money. Not desperate. I, I was a bit worried. You were worried about money. You met a very wealthy woman, and you courted her acquaintance assiduously. You make it sound so twisted. I tell you I liked her. We heard that at first she consulted you on her business affairs, her income tax returns. Yes, you know what those forms are. You can't make heads or tails of them. Or, well, she couldn't. Janet McKenzie has told us that Miss French was a very good businesswoman. Well able to handle her own affairs. Well, that's not what she told me. She said those forms worried her terribly. In filling up her income tax returns, you no doubt learned the exact amount of her income. No. No? Well, I mean, naturally, yes. Yes, very convenient. How was it, Mr. Bowl, that you never took your wife to see Miss French? I don't know. It just didn't seem to crop up. Why not? Well, I, I don't think she liked women. She preferred, shall we say, personable, Young men, and you didn't insist on bringing your wife. No, you, she knew my wife was a foreigner, and she seemed to think that we didn't get on. That was the impression that you gave her? No, but but it was wishful thinking on her part. So she was infatuated with you? No, it's like how mothers are sometimes with their sons. How? They don't want him to like a girl or get engaged or anything like that. You hoped, didn't you, for some monetary advantage from your friendship with Miss French? Not in the way you mean. Not in the way I mean? You seem to know what I mean better than I know myself. In what way, then, Mr. Bold, did you hope for monetary advantage? I repeat, in what way did you hope for monetary advantage? Well, you see, there's this new thing I've invented. A windscreen wiper that works in snow. And I was looking for someone to invest, and I thought Miss French would. But that's not the only reason I went to see her. I tell you I liked her. Yes, we've heard that very much heavily, Mr. Bull. How much you liked her. Well, it's true. I believe that about a week before Miss French's death, you were seen making inquiries of a travel agency, for particular to foreign cruises. Supposing I did? It isn't a crime, is it? Of course not. Many people go for cruises when they can pay for it. But you, you couldn't pay for it, could you, Mr. Bull? I was hard up, I told you so. And yet you were seen in this particular travel agency with a blonde, I understand. 
My wife isn't a blonde, and it was only a bit of fun anyway. You admit that you were making inquiries, not of cheap cruises, but of the most expensive and luxurious. How do you expect to pay for a thing like that? I didn't. I suggest that you knew that in a week's time, you would inherit a large sum of money from a trusting elderly lady. I didn't know anything of this sort. I was just, I was feeling fed up, and, and there they were, the posters in the window, palm trees, coconuts, and blue seas. So I went in and asked. The clerk gave me a sort of supercilious look. I was a bit shabby, so I put on a bit of an act. I started asking for the swankiest tours there were, all deluxe in a cabin on the boat deck. You really expect the jury to believe that? I don't expect them to believe anything, but that's the way it was. It was make-believe and childish, if you like, but it was a bit of fun anyway. I wasn't thinking of killing anybody or of inheriting money. So it was just a remarkable coincidence then that Miss French should be killed, leaving you her only heir just a few days later? I told you, I didn't kill her. Your story is that on the evening of October the 14th, you left Miss French's house at four minutes to nine, that you walked home, returned at five and twenty minutes past nine, and stayed there the rest of the evening. Yes. You've heard the woman remain highly to rebut that story in court. You have heard her say that you returned home, not at twenty-five minutes past nine, but at ten minutes past ten. That wasn't true. That you had blood on your sleeve. That you definitely admitted to her that you had killed Miss French. That's not true. Can you suggest any reason why the young woman who has been passing as your wife would deliberately give the evidence she had given if it were not true? No, I can't. That's the awful thing. I don't know. What's changed her? I don't understand. Very effective, I'm sure, Mr. Bull, but in this court, we deal with facts. And the fact is, we have only your word for it that you left Miss French's house at the time you said you did, that you walked home and stayed there the rest of the evening. Someone must have seen me, going into the house or walking in the street. One would certainly think so, but the only person who did see you that evening said that you returned home at ten minutes past ten. And that person said that you had blood on your sleeve. I cut my wrist. It's very easy to do in case any question arises. Oh, God. You twist everything I say. You make me sound like a different person from who I am. You cut your wrist deliberately. No, I didn't. You came home at ten past ten. No, I didn't. You, you've got to believe me. You've got to believe me. You killed Emily French. No, I didn't. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill anybody. Oh, God, this is some nightmare. It's some awful, evil dream. Thank you. 
from a personal duel between the two of you? A duel? Am I? Well, maybe I am. But she's an evil woman, John. I'm convinced of that. And the life of a young man depends on the outcome of this duel. Well, I don't think the jury liked her. No, you're right there. I don't think they did. For one, she's a foreman, and they distrust fools. Second of all, she's admitted to being married to another man. She's more or less admitting to committing bigamy. And lastly, she's not sticking to her man while she's lying down. We don't like that in this country. All for the good. Yes, but it isn't enough. There's no corroboration of statements whatsoever. He admits to seeing Miss French that evening. His fingerprints are all over the scene. And we still haven't been able to find anyone who saw him on his way home. That is the altogether damning matter of that will. God, that travel agency business just doesn't help. The woman makes a will on his favor, and the first thing he does is goes ask her about luxury cruises. Couldn't be more unfortunate. I agree. His explanation was hardly convincing. And yet, you know, John, my wife does. Does what? Gets travel agencies to make out itineraries for luxury cruises for the, for the boat. She'll plan the whole thing out for the last week, and I'll bemoan the fact that the boat misses a connection to Bermuda. She'll say we can save time by flying, but then we wouldn't see anything from the countryside, and well, what do I have? And I always say the same thing. It's all the same to me, my dear. Arrange it how you plan. We both know the story of the game, and if you want to be the same as always, staying home. Ah, now it's my wife, it's houses. Houses? Orders to view. Sometimes I think there hasn't been a house in all of England up for sale she hasn't been over. She plans how to apportion the rooms and any structural alterations that will be necessary. She even picked out the general color scheme, the curtains. Well, the fantasies of our wives aren't endless. We're small. But it does help one to understand why young bold do inquire about Peru's literature. I see. I think we've had some luck with Janet Hensley. Why, yes, you mean? Exactly. Over to her for friends. That was a good point you made about her here. Yes, but she made her own back over the wireless. What really did happen that night, John? Was it burglary with violence after all? The police apprehended it could have been. But they don't really think so. A man brought them all. The inspector seems certain that it was a dark job. Well, he may be wrong. I wonder. Who did we hear talking to Janet McKenzie that night? Seems to me that there are two answers to that. The answers being? First off, that she made the whole thing up. She figured out that the police weren't satisfied with it being a burglary. I don't think she was going to do a thing like that. Then what did she hear, John? Don't tell me it was the burglar chatting amicably with this much before he coughed her on the head, you old clown. Certainly seems unlikely. I just don't think a rather grim old woman would stick at making a thing up like that. I don't think she'd stick at anything, you know? I don't think she'd stick at anything. My God, you don't mean that. Yes, Carter, what is it? Excuse me, Sir Wilfred. There's a woman asking to see you. She says she has something that comes to take. Mental? No, I can always tell the sort. What type of woman? Uh, a rather common young woman with a free way of talking. Yeah, and what does she want? Highly unlikely. Burns, what do you think, John? We can't afford to leave any stone unturned. The young woman. Yeah, what's that? Doing it? Now, wait a minute. Talking to you yet? This is Mr. Mayfield. He is Leonard Holmes' solicitor. I am Sir Wilfred Robarts, counsel for the defense. So you are the admin of their account, are you? You know, Miss, uh... Tell me tonight if I do give you an item 
see these letters, you can advise me as to how perfect they are. Well, if you're in your own language, Roger, well, I'd like to know. I don't expect to be quiet about seeing, but there, there. If the letters do the job, they get the boy off, and put that poor bitch where she belongs, well, it's a hundred quid for me, right? If these letters prove pertinent to the defense, to help your expenses in coming here, ten pounds, I think, would not be all.
vital matter put into the hands of the prisoner's legal advisors at any time before court is adjourned, and such evidence is not just admissible, but desirable. Happily, there is evidence to be found in King against Stillman, page 346, reported in 1948. You needn't trouble to cite the authority, Sir Wilfred. I am quite familiar with it. I should like to hear the prosecution now. <coughs> Really, my lord, the court record proposal is safe in exceptional circumstances, quite unprecedented. And what, may I ask, is this startling new evidence of what Sir Wilfred speaks? Letters, my lord. Letters written by my man Howard. I should like to see these letters to which you refer, Sir Wilfred. My friend was good enough to tell me, only as we came into court, that he intended to make this submission. So that I have had no time to examine the authority. But I seem to remember a case in 1930, I think. The King against Porter, I believe. No, sire. The king is Potter, and it was reported in 1930. I appeared for the prosecution. And if my memory serves me well, your lordship's similar objection was sustained. Your memory, for once, served you ill, sire. My objection was overruled by Mr. Justice Sirwood, as it is now by me. Call her, man, Hogger. Romaine Hilger. Romaine Hilger. Mrs. Hilger, you appreciate that you are still under oath. Yes. Then I shall ask you that if you have ever known in your life a man by the Christian name of Max. I do not know what you mean. And yet it's a very simple question. Have you or have you not had a man named Max? Certainly not. You're quite sure of that. I've never known anyone called Max. Never. Hmm. And yet it's a very common name, more contraction of a name in the country where you come from. You mean to tell me that never in your life have you met a man named Max? Oh, oh, in Germany, perhaps. I, I do not remember. It is so long ago. I should not ask you to throw your mind such a long way back as that. Perhaps only a couple of weeks to, say, 17th of October? What have you got there? A letter. I do not know what you are talking I'm about. I'm talking about a letter. A letter written on the 17th of October. Perhaps you remember that day. Not particularly. Why? I suggest that on that day you wrote a letter, a letter addressed to a man named Max. I did nothing of the kind. I never wrote it. I do not know what you mean. This letter was one of a series written over a considerable period of time. Lies. All lies. You seem to have been on rather intimate terms. How dare you say a thing like that? The prisoner in his own interest will remain silent. Now, I'm not concerned with the general correspondence of these letters. One letter in particular is what I'm concerned over. My beloved Max, an extraordinary thing has happened. I believe all of our difficulties may be ended. I never wrote it. These are lies you are telling. How did you get a hold of that letter? Who gave it to me? How the letter came into my possession is irrelevant. You stole it. You are a thief as well as a liar. Or did some woman give it to you? I am right, am I not? Please confine yourself to answering counsel's questions. But I will not listen. Proceed, Sir Wilfred. I have only read the first few lines of this letter. You mean to tell me that you are definitely sure you did not write it? Of course I never wrote it. It is a forgery. It is an outrage I should be forced to listen to such a pack of lies. Lies made up by a jealous woman. I suggest that it is you who is a liar. You lied openly and flagrantly across this court and under oath. And why you lied is made clear by this letter, written down in black and white by you. You are crazy. I... Why should I write down such a lot of nonsense? Because a way opened up before you, a way to freedom. And the fact that an innocent man would be sent to his death and taken that way meant nothing to you. You went even as far as to include the final fatal detail of how you managed to injure Leonard Bull with a hammer. I never wrote that. I wrote it. He did it himself cutting the house. So, you know what is in the letter before I have read it? Hmm. Damn you, damn you, damn you! Leave her alone! Don't bully her! Well, what do you have to say to yourself? Let me out of here! Let me go! Usher, give me the rest of the chair. Mr. Wilfred, will you now read these letters out loud? Gladly, my lord. <laughs> my beloved Max, 
perhaps an extraordinary thing has happened. I believe all of our difficulties may be ended. I can come to you without any fear of endangering the valuable work you are doing in this country. The old lady I told you about has been murdered, and I think Leonard is suspected. He was there earlier that night, and his fingerprints will be all over the place. 9.30 seems to be the time. Leonard was home by then, but his alibi depends on me. On me. Supposing I say he came home much later, and that he had blood on his clothes. He did have blood on his sleeve because he cut his wrist at supper. So you'd see it would all fit in. I can even say he told me he killed her. Oh, Max, beloved, tell me I can go ahead. It would be so wonderful to be free from playing the part of a loving, grateful wife. I know the cause and the party comes first, but if Leonard was convicted of murder, I could come to you safely, and we could be together for always. Your adoring Romaine. Romaine Halder, we go back to the witness box. You have heard the letters read. What have you to say? Nothing. Romaine, tell him you didn't write it. I know you didn't write it. My lord, that concludes the case for the defense. Sir Wolford, do you have any evidence as to who these letters were addressed? They were submitted to me quite anonymously, anonymously last night, my lord, and this man seemed to have been in some rather subversive activities in this country. You will never find out who he is, never. I don't care what you do to me, you shall never know. Do you wish to re-examine? Really, my lord, I find it somewhat difficult in view of these startling developments. Mrs. Hilder, you are, I think, of a highly nervous temperament, and being a foreigner, you may not quite realize the responsibilities that lie upon you when you take the oath in an English court of law. If you have been admitted into saying or writing anything that is not true, if, if, you, wrote these, if you wrote these letters in any spirit of make-believe, do not hesitate to, to say so now. What do you go on torturing me? I wrote the letters, and I let them go. My lord, I submit that this witness is in such a state of agitation that she hardly knows what she is saying or admitting. You may remember, Mr. <laughs> Myers, that Sir Wilfred previously cautioned the witness at the time of her previous statement and impressed upon her the sacred nature of the oath she had given. Miss Hilder, I should like to inform you that this is not the end of the matter. You cannot commit perjury in this country without being brought to an account. I can assure you that proceedings will very shortly be taken into you. The punishment for perjury can be severe. You may stand down. Sir Wolfram, will you now address the jury on behalf of the defense? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when the truth is self-evident, it speaks for itself. Nothing I can say, I'm sure, will add to the straightforward story delivered by this young man or to the wicked attempt to incriminate him. Evidence as which you have just seen. Members of the jury, have you decided on your verdict? We have. Do you find Leonard Bowles guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lord. Leonard Bowles, you are hereby found not guilty of the murder of Miss Emily French on October the 14th. You are hereby discharged and free to leave this place. Mm -hmm. so infatuated with a woman 
that he's been blind to what she's really like. That woman did her level best to put a rope around her neck. Don't you forget it. Yes, but why? There's something there I don't understand. She's always seemed so devoted, yet all this time she's been going with this other fellow. I, there's something more there. I just can't quite place it. Is there still a crowd? Better wait here, man. No. Are you protecting Leonard from me? He really does know me. You've done enough harm. May I even congratulate him on being free? No thanks to you. And rich. Rich? Yes, I think, Mr. Vole, you inherit a great deal of money. Money doesn't seem to be of much importance to me. Not after what I've been through. Romaine, I can't understand. Leonard, I can't explain. No! As I warned you, the penalty for perjury can be heavy. I do think that you might go to jail. Romaine, I'm sure everything will come round. Don't worry. Will you never see sense, Paul? Now, as to the matter of probing. I'll have you know that the first day I met you, I knew you were up to this little game of yours. And by God, I've done it. I've gotten him off in spite of you. In spite of me? You don't deny you did your level best to hang him, man. Tell me, if I said that she was home with me all that evening, they have believed me? Why shouldn't they? Hmm. Because they would have said to themselves, this woman loves this man. She would say or do anything for him. They would have sympathy with me, yes, but they would not have believed me. If you had been telling the truth, they'd have no choice but to believe you. I wonder. I did not want them to believe you. I wanted them to dislike you, to mistrust me, to believe that I was a liar. And then all my lives were broken, then they would have believed. So now you know the whole story, mister. Well, a kiss, May. Oh my god! Yes, the woman with the letter. I wrote the letter. I brought them to you. I was that woman. It was not you who had freedom from letters. It was I. And because of it, I shall go to prison. But at the end of it, we will be together, happy, loving each other. My dear Mrs. Volk, couldn't you have trusted me? We do have faith that our English judicial system is the best in the world. But you see, I could not risk it. Because you thought he was innocent. And you knew he was innocent. I, I understand. Ah, but you don't understand at all. I knew he was guilty. But, but weren't you afraid? Afraid? Of linking your life with that of the murder. Mrs. Volk, I said it the first time we met, and it stands true today. You're a very remarkable woman. younger than you are. I've got the money, I've been acquitted, and I can't be tried again. So don't go running your mouth off, or you'll just get yourself hanged as an accessory after the fact. No, that will not happen. I will not be tried for an accessory. 